All right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another day of Saber Sims DFS Office Hours. It is Thursday, January 12th of 2023, Friday the 13th tomorrow. Just realize that uh, for all of you superstitious people out there, be careful. It'll be Friday the 13th tomorrow. We'll still be here for a good show, nevertheless. But that being said, uh, jokes aside, we got a six-game NBA slate tonight, as well as a 12-game NHL slate. That should be fun. Uh, PGA kicked off a little earlier today, and uh, you know, plenty of PGA showdown to play all weekend. Got NFL on Saturday, so just action-packed time to uh, be playing DFS. If you are not joined up with Saberson, there's a link in the description below to a seven-day, no strings attached free trial. Uh, sounds like a great time to get your feet wet and start that trial. Check us out. If you guys have any questions, we do this show Monday through Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, for those of you who are new here, you know uh, who's talking. My name is Andrew. I'm one of the coaches over here at SaberSim. On this show, we talk about, you know, DFS strategy, answer any and all questions that come in in the Office Hours channel over in our Discord server. There's a link in the description below to join the Discord. Uh, what is up, Aaron? How you doing, my man? Uh, if if uh, you know you guys have questions, just tuning in now. Throw them in the live YouTube chat. We will get to all the questions before the end of the show. Promise you guys that. But that being said, gonna get Saberson pulled up here. Uh, for those of you who might not have seen it yet, uh, Jordan and I recorded a video yesterday and released it. I know I teased at it a little bit, uh, but we ended up doing it. We ended up getting it released right away we had a ton of fun recording this video talking about an nba dfs uh research process and how to add value you know to saber sim how to find spots to possibly take stands uh was a really good video about an hour long it is you know if you if you uh sign in to saber sim you should have a little banner down here at the bottom with a link to go straight to that video would highly recommend checking it out saw there were a couple questions related to the video that we released. So we are going to uh, start with the questions in Discord and go from there. But check out the video we did. It was a lot of fun and uh, hope that you guys get a lot out of it. All right. So first question that came in from Gilliman. Question is, hey, Andrew, I watched the new video and I was wondering how do you adjust minutes projections on the app? If you can do that, who would that affect the player's or how would that affect the players' projections in the Sims? Okay, so this is a good question. So, you know, I think two things, um, you know, two two kind of questions from the video. There is not a way to adjust minutes by themselves, and there is not a way to adjust fantasy points per minute, uh, like as a column. But but we can recreate that, right? So what you ha what you see here is the minutes across the entire Sim database. So. Like on, on average across all our Sims, Luca plays 37.89 minutes. And on average, he scores 63.25 points, right? Um, if we want to adjust this, or if we want to find the fantasy points per minute, what you should do is you should pull up your calculator. And let me just let me just do that really quickly. I'll pull up a calculator and then uh we could do that here. So show you guys exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna bring my calculator on the screen here just going to go uh full screen and what i want to do let me just move some things around so i can i can see this while we're going so we said luca scores uh his average projection is 63.25 points right so 63.25 we're just going to divide that by his minutes which is 37 uh go back 1.89 and that equals 1.8 six six nine so like 1.67 so we are saying that luca's fantasy points per minute is about 1.67 right so we can just jot that down i'm just going to jot that down right here 1.67 all right so then now i'm going to go back to the saber sim app here if i want to say that you know what i think luca plays 40 minutes instead of 37.89. I think his average minutes is going to be closer to 40 for whatever re reason brought you to that, to that point, right? What I would do is I would just take this 1.67 uh, and then multiply that by 40. 
and then 66.8. Now I would just go in and make that his new projection. So what I'm saying is that, you know, I think Luca plays more minutes and I'm going to adjust his projection by that same fantasy point per minute uh, standard. So, so, you know, in the video I talked about that, you know, I really trust Saberson for whatever the fantasy points per minute is. So if like Saberson says his fantasy points per minute is 1.67, I'm going to trust that. And then I'm just going to adjust the minutes uh, incrementally or, or I'm going to adjust his projection based on, you know, however more minutes I think he's going to get times that fantasy points per minute to add to the projection. So just exactly how we did it. If I think he's going to play 40 minutes, I'm just going to take the fantasy point per minute, multiply that by the additional minutes. And then now this comes out to 66.8, which would be my new projection in that case. So getting, getting back to this question, you know, how do you adjust minutes projections in the app? You can't exactly do it. This is like an artificial way of doing it, but that is how I would do it. So, if you're looking for for a way to do it, uh, that that is the best way. And then that is also how you figure out the fantasy points per minute. It's just my projection divided by minutes. And that will give you a fantasy point per minute for you to work with. All right. Next question here from Elder. See a couple questions coming in the live YouTube chat. Thank you, everybody. We will get to those once we get through the Discord questions. All right. Question from Elder. How to changing a player's projection add value if Saberson already incorporates a player's full range of outcomes? This is a good question and going to be happy to talk about it right now. So what, what is happening when we are adjusting a uh, player's projection, right? Let's go back to the Luka example. You know, we're going to adjust his projection to 66.8. What this is going to do, this is a 3.55 projection increase. So for every sim where Luca scores 60, he's going to now score 63.5. For every sim where he scores 40, he's going to score 43.5, right? We are going to take his range of outcomes and we are just going to shift them by whatever uh, adjustment you make. So in this case, you know, we're going to shift all of his outcomes up by three points. But what, what you're saying is that, you know, you believe that Luca's range of outcomes is actually higher than what Sabersim, uh, Sabersim's database believes it to be. That is, you know, a personal choice, and and um, that is kind of what you are doing by by adjusting the projection. You know, I, I will say that you know we do sim, you know, games thousands and thousands of times. That does not mean that we account for for every possible scenario, right? I'm I'm sure there are times where you know. Uh, I think a good example is like Luca's hundred point game, right? He scored like a over, I think it was 110 fantasy points. Uh, you know, that, that would be more than, than this 99th percentile. Right. So, so we, we do account for a vast range of outcomes, but I don't think, you know, um, I think there are more possible outcomes than, than beyond what, what we sim. Uh, we we account for so much of it, right? And and we're gonna have those outcomes more often than not. But but sometimes you're gonna get these crazy crazy games, right? Like the Luca game, I think is is a good example. So I think that there's nothing wrong with uh, shifting a player's range of outcomes if you think that you know they are gonna be on the higher side. Because in that case, you know we are gonna shift Luca's 99th uh, percentile projection up by that three point. Uh, five metric and then now this becomes closer to 95 right so that is what you're doing when you are adjusting individual player projections all right uh second question from elder here and the question is i just watched the what happens if i change team totals video on the website one thing i still have a question about once i change the team totals for team x am i still taking advantage of the upside of the players on that team or are the builds based only on the new custom projections and not accounting for a player's range of outcomes? Okay, so yeah, this is a good follow-up. So the difference between adjusting uh, player projections, there is a difference between adjusting player projections and team totals. So when we adjust an individual player projection, it is just for that player, we are just shifting that individual player's range of outcomes, right? If we were to come in and, you know, add 10 points to Dallas, that is not only going to affect Luca. That is going to affect all of the other players on his team as well. It should even affect some of the players on the Lakers. Yeah, um, higher scoring environment. They might um, end up scoring more points in in this uh, 
instance here. So, but by adjusting the team totals is going to have an effect on the entire team. But what is also going to happen is that, you know, essentially what we are going to do is that we are going to start uh, discounting Sims on the lowest end for Dallas. Since we are shifting Dallas's team total up, we are going to start getting rid of Sims in the, that we are considering where Dallas scores really low until the new mean for the teams reaches this new number that you've set. So we are going to discount low scoring Dallas games until we can get that new mean team total up to 130. That is still, you know, and then, and then from that sample, you know, the sample got a little smaller, but from that sample, we are still going to bucket the Sims and take Sims out and build your lineups the same exact way. So you still are accounting for upside for correlation for upside correlation and, um, using the sims in that instance you're just using less of them based on this new adjustment that you've made but good question there elder let me know if there's any follow-up to either of the two questions that you had all right gonna hit this next question here from phantom and phantom said with the update to uh with the update to the sim diversity slider a while back were the correlation and ownership fade sliders updated accordingly as well. If not, was just wondering if it would be good to turn those off and then add like a geo mean rule for ownership stacking rule. If it's a stacking sport, et cetera, to help guide the Sims or no rules and just turn correlation slash ownership fade off entirely and let the Sims handle the rest. Okay. So good question, Phantom uh, to, to answer this first part of the question. Yes. When we made the change, from sim variance to sim diversity, we did do like a thorough review of all the sliders because we needed to know how the new sim diversity slider was going to interact with the other sliders as opposed to the way sim variance interacted with the sliders. So the sliders were adjusted. You know, there was a question yesterday about min salary being lowered. That was another change that came from this entire review when sim diversity was incorporated. I would say that, you know, the sliders are, are set, you know, where we feel that they should be based on our testing uh, with the sim diversity slider. What I will say that, you know, one thing that we've, we've talked about is that it is okay to adjust the sliders uh, as you see fit, right? Maybe you're, uh, you know, not seeing as many stacks in your lineups and you want more stacks. I, I would try increasing the correlation slider before going and setting a rule. Uh, give that a shot. See if that works. Uh, you know, you talk about the concept of, of turning the sliders off. It's it's a really interesting one, right? So so in the Sims, there is natural correlation, right? Because we are simulating simulating the games, uh, we are going to be able to figure out what players are correlated, right? And that is what we display with our uh, correlation uh, coefficients or or uh, correlation values here, showing which players are correlated to who. Uh, pretty interesting that Luca is highest correlation is Troy Brown kind of kind of strange there but but like these these values you know come from running Sims uh at like basically zero zero ten you kind of think of it that way right we are we are simulating the games uh one 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 game at a time and that is where those values come from right I think that you know the sliders are important because especially in stacking type sports, NHL, MLB specifically, uh, the Sims give you some organic correlation, but you can, you know, inflate that correlation or, or manipulate it to get stronger stacks, to get better stacks, to take more, to take advantage of more of correlation. Right. And there is a point of kind of diminishing returns or, or a point where you could inherently, um, start to negatively affect your lineups, right? Maybe, you know, correlation at, at 10 is probably too high, right? Going to be uh, some some crazy high stacked lineups that might be negative EV at that point, right? So so I, I would um, use the slider default as like a starting point and then feel comfortable moving it up, you know, a couple ticks in, in either direction, but I would never really make the jump from like two to 10. I think that's like probably way too high. Uh, a great thing to do is experiment with it, you know, come in here, run one at 10 and see, and see what it is. Uh, run one at seven, run one at, you know, five, and then run one at the default, run one at zero and then, you know, run some builds and, and see how they look differently and see how 
that adjustment is affecting what is getting uh, built and put into your lineup portfolio on the other side. But I would say don't be afraid to adjust it. I think it's still important to uh, take advantage of correlation. And, you know, it's it's at a setting of two by default here. It's low correlation. But even in, even in a sport like NBA where correlation is less impactful, uh, Saberson is still saying, you know, account for it somewhat. I think, you know, at, at this setting, what it is mainly going to do, in, in my opinion, is help you avoid negatively correlated players, help you avoid the situations where there are two uh, high dollar players on the same team, like, or I forgot Kevin Durant is out right now, but maybe like James Harden and Joel Embiid, you know, they probably have high negative correlation to each other, um, which surprisingly they don't. Uh, a lower negative correlation, but it will more than likely help you avoid the negatively correlated players being in the same lineup together at a low value in a sport like NBA. So I think it's totally fine to, to leave on in, in that instance. All right. Um, last, last part. I, I don't think we talked about, you know, was the geo mean rule for, for ownership. Um, I, I would, I would lean more towards letting ownership fade, uh, slider you know do do some of the ownership fade work for you i think ownership fade you know the way it is built and the way it interacts with saber score is is all really good i don't think you really need a uh, geo mean rule for for like large nba slates in general i i typically stay away from like product or geo mean rules for anything other than short slates or like showdowns you know i'm thinking like two three game nba slates somewhere i, I might want to mix it in but i think ownership fade you know, comparing players' ownership to similar player to to players at the same position, and then constructing a lineup based off of that, and then that uh, construction being graded by Saber Score in the post build is is a fairly good uh, you know process and and accounts for ownership really really well there. So I think you know leaving ownership fade on, leaving correlation on are good. I think they I think that you can adjust them. You know, you could you could bring this down. Maybe you want to bring ownership fade down and add a ownership fade rule, an ownership rule in the post build with a custom metric. I think that's okay. I think that you know lowering it and then doing the rule makes more sense. That way you're not doing so much double counting. All right, moving on here. Uh, got a little feedback from Elder here. Going to get this one in the chat. Elder said, "Ah, I see. I've had the wrong premise in my mind that a custom projection would only change the mean within Saber Sim." And not shift the entire distribution. Thank you much, Andrew. Yep. So happy to clarify that for you. And uh, you know, just just to be to be clear one more time for everybody watching, if you adjust the player's projection, you are shifting their entire range of outcomes. We are still gonna randomly uh, sample the sims and take advantage of this distribution. But that is what you are doing. All right. Question here from Naj, and Naj said. I watched that, that new NBA video you did with Jordan, and I heard you say some people like just to do uh, risk management. Can you explain what you mean by risk management and how to use it? Yes, this is a great question, right? So basically, you know, the 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 video goes into a lot of detail about uh, NBA research, but that's not for everybody, right? And and we understand that, and I think it's okay to not do that. You know, by by not doing that. I think like you are not at a, uh, I can't win phase, right? I think that if you were to come on, you know, trust the projections, trust the ownership, you have a very good chance of still building uh, good lineups that can take down a GPP on a 9 to 9 basis, right? What we are doing by all that additional research is trying to add more value, trying to find spots that we think we see a flaw in, right? And and there are some times you're going to do research and not find a spot. And then there are other times where you are going to find something where you might want to take a stand, take a shot on, right? I think we had two good examples of that in the video. We looked at the Bulls, uh, didn't really see anything wrong with the way that uh, players were being projected with DeMar DeRozan out. We did see, you know, the Zach Levine upside situation where he was projected for like 36.8 minutes. We thought he might play more. He did end up playing more, played 41 minutes. So that was a good find. And then the situation with Dario Saric uh, maybe being a little over-owned given some recency bias, had a uh, average-ish game yesterday, so that all kind of worked out. So it ended up being a really good video. Uh, 
you know, maybe you don't have the time to do that. Uh, you don't want to do that. You want to trust some of Saber Sims more core inputs. That's totally fine. When we refer to risk management, what we are really referring to is managing the exposures in the post build, you know, using min uniques, um, looking at individual players and seeing if you have too much leverage for your own comfort in that specific scenario. So, so what I'll say right off the bat here is that, you know, um, Giannis was ruled out for today. Looks like the ownership has not um, adjusted for that yet. Some of the point projections have. So it should be a lot of Milwaukee value on today's slate uh, right off the bat. So getting back to, you know, managing risk. So we're going to trust the inputs on the home screen. We're going to run a build and we are going to do most of our work in this post build screen. You can still add a lot of value here, right? Uh, First things first, you know, one thing that I always like to do is adjust the min uniques, right? Decrease the correlation between each lineup in your portfolio. So if this is at four, what that's going to say is that, you know, every lineup that I'm playing cannot have more than five players that are the same because there are nine players in an NBA lineup over on FanDuel, right? So first things first, you know, that is risk management. Um, This way, when one lineup does does really good. There's less of a chance that all of your lineups are going to be kind of really similar that way. Like they all, they all do really well or they all fail, right? That is a very um, high risk approach and can have a lot of variance, right? By doing this, you know, if one lineup does bad, that does not mean that all the rest of your lineups are going to go down with that one lineup in that instance, or, or that, that chance of happening is a lot lower because you are saying that, every lineup must have so many pieces different. That is a big risk aspect. Another one would be coming in here and looking at your top exposures, you know, and seeing that if you want to adjust any of these guys, right? Uh, Maybe, maybe that, you know, let's take this for what it was. Uh, Maybe this is the actual ownership. There is no, you know, pending ownership change, right? Maybe having 90% of a 0.3% players way too much leverage for you. And you want to dial that back. Uh, that's okay. You know, that is a form of risk management, right? Maybe you want to come in here and look at your team stacks. Maybe you don't want to play any, any team, you know, more than three players from a single team, right? So you come in here and you, uh, zero out these, uh, four stacks, right? So, so that's risk management, right? Risk management is anything you're doing in the post build to make you more comfortable with the lineups that you are taking with you into your contest. I think that, you know, if you were to, just build lineups based on the inputs and then get to this screen, feel uncomfortable. If you're, you know, you're looking at this for the first time, no adjustments, you are feeling uncomfortable, but you're saying, I want to trust Saber Sim. So I'm just going to play these lineups, but it makes you feel uneasy, right? I think that you probably have not exercised enough risk management at that point. You should always be very comfortable with the lineups that you are ultimately submitting into your, uh, into the contest that you're playing. So, I would always, you know, take a minute, do some risk management. The great thing about adjusting min uniques is that it is going to uh, inherently decrease uh, some of the exposures. It's going to organically do it. It's one of the great features that I like. You know, at five min uniques, our 95 guys went down to 70 and then everybody else gets adjusted. Uh, Saber Sim is going to, you know, keep the most important pieces and then shift everyone else uh, around that, uh, around those, you know, core group of players. So I think it's a great tool to use, and I, I um, use it on a night-to-night basis myself. All right. Uh, M. Dombluski with a uh, question here, and uh, a good question for that matter. said, how do I get the Nike Saberson hat? Uh, if you guys are not aware, you know, we have the winner circle. Uh, what it is, is it is a promotional program, basically, where we – promote um it's it's a it's like a kind of rewards program you know call it call it what you want right so i'm gonna pull it up here um it is over you know if you come on to saber sim up here at the top it's called the winner circle if you click on it uh and you follow the the rules here what you have to do is you have to set the saber sim logo as your avatar on DraftKings or fanduel if you have a win that is a, uh, I believe it's a top five win, you know, let's go down to the rules here. It is a finish in the top five of a contest for at least $1,000. Um, 
the prize must be at least 10 times your entry fee. The tournament must be must have at least 100 entrants, and you must use one of our approved logos, which you could find over at the top. There is a link to the logos that for you to download for Yahoo, for uh, DraftKings, for FanDuel. Upload that. Play, play contests, right? And then we have different prize buckets. If you win, you know, a million-dollar win, you get free Sabres in for life, a Rolex, a uh, swag box, a T-shirt, hoodie, hat, and backpack. I believe it is at the 10K price here where you can win a um, a hat. So if you have a win of $10,000, you can get three free months, a swag box, a T-shirt, a hoodie, and a hat. Looks like M. Dumbluski is uh maybe maybe uh trying to trying to uh, get some clout uh, M. Dumbluski because you are right here with an 80k victory, good for second place in an NBA contest in the 2021 season. So congrats on that win. You should have a hat. If you don't have a hat, uh, reach out to us and we will see what we can do about that. But just a good plug for our winner circle. Um, you know everybody is uh you know. Who's winning? Who's using the logo? You are getting a spot on this board, and you are able to come over here and uh, see your name. See your name over on the screen. You know, I got one here uh, myself. Just uh, just a fun one to uh, call out. Second place in a milli was was a great sweat. Was down to the wire. Had a lot of fun in that tournament. Um, came off a satellite ticket, so you know uh, you can get satellites to these big NBA GPPs and give yourself a shot at a big prize there. But Gonna 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 get back to the stream here and get back to these questions, but good question there from M Dumb Blueski. All right, so let me get Saberson pulled back up here and we will get over to the next question. All right. Uh next question from Sklar Mageddon here in the Discord. A lot of questions today. Should be a nice long show. We'll get to everything before the end of the show. So question is: is it possible to use GeoMeme as a way to sort? or filter post-build rather than pre-build so that we don't alter the sim optimals up front. Scarm again, this is a great question. Yes, there is that, that we added that just for that exact reason, right? So by adding, you know, a geo mean rule in the pre-build, you are essentially affecting the, the, the lineups that can come in to your, uh, that can be built, that can be accepted into your pool, right? By doing it in the post-build, it is more of a filtering aspect. So if you see this little filter icon next to the trash, next to the lineup sorting, you could click this. You could add a filter for whatever you want, right? Maybe, you know, as, as a basic example, um, well, actually, I have it here. So so what you can do if you're on the pro plan, you could create a custom metric and you would create the custom metric here. You could go to add metric. Um, and then what you would do is you would create one that that looks like this. And then it would be my own product geo mean value. So what it is going to do, it is going to show the geo mean value of each individual lineup. And then you can sort by that. So what I could do is I could come in here, I could add a filter and I could say, you know, hide lineups where my geo mean is greater than, I don't know, maybe like 30. And then there's none, you know, let's go down to 25. See how many lines we get rid of. So at 25, uh, Geo mean, you know, there was one lineup above that number, but, but basically it is a filter like that. So, so we, what you have to do is you have to create the custom metric first, and then it will be uh, uh, added as a drop down for you to include as a filter. We should have a vi new video coming out in relate in, in relation to that exact feature, but that is how you do it in the post build. So add a custom metric for geo mean and then go into add a filter and then that'll get added as a uh a variable that you can uh create a uh filter by but good question there and uh let me make sure i answer that uh yep if anybody you know you guys don't have um the pro plan you guys don't have custom metrics the other way to do it is as a lineup rule and when you can come in here and do is add a new rule go to aggregate rule go to my own uh, geometric mean no more than, you know, and we could say 25, right? And then I would just save that as a rule here. Uh, this banner is in my way down here, so I'm not going to save it, but then I would save that as a rule. And then that would be an, that would be a, uh, threshold or, or marker that every lineup in your pool has to meet before being accepted into your pool. So that is another way to do it. If you're not on the pro plan. All right. Next question from Naj here. 
Question is, how <laughs> uncrabby caveat? I just like read read your uh, question here. I, I, it's a it's it's a good one. We, we will get to it in the YouTube chat. All right, question from Naj. How much does Lace Swap tinker with my lineups? Uh, I always wonder if they are messing with unique builds I make post build. Okay, so Lace Swap, you know, is is essentially um, the way it is right now. It is rebuilding every lineup one time, and the, it is taking you know a new subset of Sims from the database for every lineup and rebuilding the lineup. You know, I think every time you run a build, it is going to be a little different from than the last one because we are randomly bucketing the Sims and we are pulling different Sims each time or a different combination of Sims each time we are building a lineup. And, you know, that goes like for, for you know, across the user base, right? We have thousands and thousands of Sims. So there are ultimately, you know, millions upon millions of, of combinations of Sims that we can group and bucket, which is why users do not get duplicate lineups. Um, so, so that, that is that part in a nutshell. One thing that we are building right now that is over at beta.sabersim.com, if you're interested in using it, is late swap pools. It is in beta because there are still bugs with it, and we are still working on um, fixing all of those things. So if you use it and run into issues, I, we, we highly suggest that you or uh, we ask that you guys use the report a problem link. Anytime you guys run into an issue, that will help us out to fix those bugs and then push it to the production app that way everybody could use it but essentially you know late swap pools solves that problem you know we're going to build you a pool of lineups and then you can go in there adjust exposures adjust min uniques and do all of the things that you can do pre-build in a late swap it is going to be a huge value add um we know that users on who are using it in beta love it so if you if you have some extra time during a late swap i would check it out uh, can be a little buggy, so just keep the regular SaberSim app close and always be willing to swap back and do a regular late swap until we get all of those bugs sorted out. But that should help out a lot with, with you know, keeping the adjustments that you want to make, keeping them in uniques, all that good stuff. All right, next question here from Larson. And Larson said, Andrew, with sim diversity being high in large field tournament builds, how do I know if I'm late swapping out of an optimal lineup just to get a sub optimal because the builder is looking for diversity? Uh, Larson, this is a this is a good question, right? I think that you know it really comes down to what do you value, um, how much of your bankroll are you playing on a night to night basis? So, so gonna go back to this build that we were just talking about, right? I think that you know. Something important to think about here is that, you know, look at the lineups that you're playing, right? We, we have many uniques set to five here for diversity's sake. And right away, you know, if we go over to pool, we, we're skipping lineup two now. We're skipping lineup four now. We're skipping lineup seven now. So, you know, these are not the top 20 Sabre score lineups. We are playing lineups all the way down to lineup number 70, 71 here. And the, in the, um, the question was blocking it, but we're playing lineup rank number 71 here, right? So that is something that you are sacrificing, right? You are sacrificing some amount of expected value to decrease variance, right? So so it's ultimately, you know, up to you to kind of make that call. You know, do you just want to play the highest ranked lineups, you know, by whatever metric you're sorting by, whether that be Sabre score, whether that be a percentile, whether that be a custom metric that you have created, right? Do you just want to value the highest EV lineups? Um, the, the one thing, you know, one knock on, on SaberSim is that, you know, the builder does not understand risk management. It is just trying to pack in the highest EV lineups, no matter what that is, especially with min uniques at one. That is why you're going to get a lot of like highly concentrated exposures, high leverage plays sometimes. Um, that That is a personal choice, right? That is a much higher risk portfolio. And if you want to decrease some of that risk, decrease some of the variance, uh, adding mini uniques in is great, but that is a trade-off, right? So that is a, that is a question that you have to answer for yourself and understand if that trade-off is worth it. For me, what I try to do is I try and adjust, you know, inputs in, in, in the home screen and, you know, possibly use some filters. I like to get my pool to a point where I am comfortable playing every lineup from rank one to rank 500, or maybe I'm doing a filter, right? And maybe I'm doing like um, 
a projection filter and I'm saying, you know, high to lineups where projected score is less than, I don't know, 285, maybe let's give this a shot. So boom, I've, I've, I've removed 49 lineups from this. Um, maybe now I'm comfortable with any of these 451 lineups and I'm comfortable playing any of those one, 451. So I think it's important to do things to make sh- to make you comfortable playing every lineup that's available in your pool. And if you do that, now you should be more comfortable adding in those diversity things because uh, you are more comfortable with, with all the lineups in your pool because you have done some pool curation, player pool curation, you know, lineup curation, whatever it may be. But those are things that I am thinking about and I am trying to weigh and balance when uh, making these decisions. All right. Next question from Naj here. Oh, actually, um, gonna gonna do a follow up from Squarma get in here, and uh, just do this follow up and then answer this question from Naj. So Squarma get in said, "Thanks, Andrew. So, can you only do that post build on the pro plan? Um, so you can use filters post build. I do not. I I believe you have to be able to build the custom metric." the geo mean custom metric in order to do it post build. So you have to one, add the custom metric and then two, now that becomes a drop down here on this screen. So my, my understanding is that for that geo mean one specifically, yes, you would either have to do it post build on the pro plan or pre build via an aggregate rule. But those are the two options that I am aware of. All right. Moving on to this next question from Nosh. This is our last question in the discord. And then we'll be jumping over to the live YouTube chat. All right, question says, if I structure a few lineups post-build for my NBA 20 max to have three players from a certain team, will late swap respect that or will I have to set a rule for them to respect it? Uh, Naj, it will not respect it by default. What you will have to do is two things, really, or one of two things. Option one, come into the home screen, set min exposures to the players that you are looking to keep. You know, maybe it's um, maybe it's Luca at like 25%. Maybe you have some value plays in here. Maybe Gabe Vincent at 25% and Drew Holiday at 25%. You would have to set this, and then this would now be an input that uh, SaberSim looks at when doing late swap. Or the other option is to come into a lineup rule and then do a group manual rule and then say use at least three, and maybe, maybe you lock them in, right? Maybe they were like a core group of players for you, and then I would just use at least three, I would save this rule, and then now this is a rule that Saverson has to follow when doing your late swap that will make sure that all three of those players stay in every single lineup that you uh, late swap. But those are the two ways I would do it. All right, hopping over to YouTube chat here. Question from Franklin. says, why don't I have the same columns like minutes, rebounds, two points, the column tabs don't show these? Okay, so... um, if you are on the pro plan or if you are on a uh, if you are on a plan prior to December 31st, you should be able to see all of these stats. Um, I would come over here and check to make sure that they are checked in. Uh, if you are on the standard plan, I believe as of like January 1st, uh, you are not going to see the detailed stats. That is a pro gated feature. So if you uh, come over to your account and if you sign up for the Saberson Pro, you will be able to see all the detailed stats. It is a recent change we made. Anybody who had those stats viewable prior to the change still has them only for new signups. It is on the Pro plan. All right. Uncrabby Cabby said, hey, Andrew, if the Sims are truly simulating how a game is to play out, why is it that they continue to overvalue the highest point per dollar players as they are not necessarily the best plays? Uh, Uncrabby Cabby, I think that, you know, as far as like value, right? What I would say is that, you know, for for value plays, right? We look at a slate like tonight. This is a fairly, I would say, well priced slate. We don't see anybody over six value as opposed to nights, you know, a couple of nights ago, the Orlando Robinson play, um, you know, the 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 major heat value we saw, the major Phoenix value that we've been seeing. Uh, those, those are really good plays, right? Those guys are getting a lot of usage, a lot of minutes. They are very low salary. Not only are they, you know, getting the usage and the salary, but they're allowing you to get to other high price guys like the Lucas, like the, um, I think Kawhi Leonard had a really good night the other day. Jimmy Butler had a really good night the other day. So 
not only is you know the usage of the minutes there, but the salary savings allow you to get more uh, higher upside, higher salary players into those lineups. It definitely is a trade off. Um, if you are you know uncomfortable with with so many of those plays, I think the easiest thing to do is to come into the post build, sort by value, and then look at some of your exposures to these top value players. Um, I know that, you know, like Orlando Robinson didn't have a really good game when he played. Um, some of these guys haven't worked out this week. That happens. Unfortunately, if, if the risk is too much for you, what I would do is I would come in here and handle it post build and just understand that some of these high value plays might not be as, um, what, what can I say as, uh, I don't want to say like a, like a lock, but, uh, but are, but are a little more fragile, right? And I think that's like the right term to use. You know, the projection is a little more fragile. They might be getting the minutes and the usage, but, you know, we're we're uncertain about their actual uh, performance and what they might actually perform at. We've talked about the concept of fragile value before. You can come into a post build and you can adjust projections, right? And see how much exposure you're getting to a player if you decrease that projection. You know, let's take somebody like Gabe Vincent. Let's lower him about 10% projection, you know, from 85%. Uh, he drops down to, wow. Uh, oh no, no, we still see him here. So, so Gabe Vincent is a, is a great example. You know, we had him at 85% of our lineups. We dropped his point projection by 10% and we, and he did not move. Right. So the builder is saying, you know, we still think he is a good play even at a lower point total. Uh, sometimes you're going to adjust it and this player is going to move significantly and, and they are going to, drop and and fall uh for for whatever reason there so really surprised you know he is not dropping in in this instance i think something is a little wrong i probably made too many changes or or too many inputs here but let's try this again so gabe vincent oh you know what i did i created a rule to use at least i created that rule to use gabe vincent in every single lineup so i think i think it had something to do with that i must have created that that gave Vincent role prior to doing that. So, so something funny going on there for sure, but you could, you could test the concept of fragile va- value in the post build by adjusting projections and seeing how that affects uh, what, what, uh, how much exposure you get to those players. What's going to happen is Saber Sim is going to take that new projection, going to re reevaluate the Saber scores of every lineup and shift some scores up, shift some scores down, and that will lead to different exposures at the top and bottom ranges of your pool. Okay. Uh, next question from HC. Hi, Andrew. Have you attempted to try to build your own model on Pro? If so any suggestions without blowing the app up? Um, if we're referring to custom metrics, I definitely have experimented with doing that as far as, you know, building my own model. Uh, I have not done that. So, you know, if you're, if you're building a custom metric, you know, I, I, I typically like to have my own for showdown specifically, mostly because Saber Sim is accounting for optimals in, in, in the Sim database with Saber score, but is not accounting for duplication. So I have my own custom metric that I use to try and um, account for duplication. I've, I've experimented with a lot of different things, still kind of tweaking it and changing it from time to time. Um, has, you know, aspects of geo mean, aspects of salary, aspects of projected points. I think these are all things that you can use to try and get more unique with your lineups. All right. Uh, next question here in the YouTube chat. On topic of correlation, Saberson correlates players based on their median outcomes or their ceilings. If Embiid hits 95th percentile, how does his teammates correlate then? This is a really good question. Um, so we focus on what we call upside correlation. It is really the correlation that players have at the top ranges of their outcomes. Like you are speaking about, uh, we don't care how well somebody correlates to Joel, Joel, Joel Embiid when he is getting a 25th percentile outcome, having a horrible game. We really want to focus in and zone in on those outcomes where he does well and how the players correlate to him in that instance. So that is a change we made sometime last year, but it was a good change and and we feel is ultimately a better way of accounting for player correlations. But, but yes, exactly as you described for that exact reason. All right, scrolling down here. Question from Kenny. I have a question. Most nights I usually break even on what I put in and other nights I make a small game. What steps can I make to get to that extra step and cash more? Uh, Kenny, this is a good question. 
to be fair, you know, it sounds like you have a really good process, right? I think something that gets lost more often than not is that the sites are raking these contests at a pretty high rate, usually 10 to 15%, usually on the 15% side for the lower stakes stuff. So, so if you are breaking even, making a small gain, you are making that 15% back and you are making some, um, some more profit percent on top of that, right? That is a winning process. Um, if I've ever seen one, right? So what I would encourage you to do is, you know, it sounds like it's a winning process. I would encourage you to play more unique lineups, um, you know, play more 20 maxes, maybe experiment with some of the 150 maxes. If you aren't doing that already, that way you can get more unique lineups down, you know, that winning process, you are going to get to some of those, you know, uh, top 0.1% outcomes. Uh, the more you play, the more consistent you are, the more unique lineups you play on a night to night basis and, and, and play as many slates as you can. But Kenny, it sounds like you're on the right track. I really don't want to tell you something that is going to cause you to deviate. I would just say, you know, be patient, exercise bankroll management, play more unique lineups and play uh, more, more days. If you are only playing a certain number of days a week. All right. Next question here from all gems. FanDuel has some smaller GPPs with 8 max and 11 max entries. Should I be setting those at 3 or 20 max on SaberSim? Uh, really a preference, I would say. You know, I've, I've heard people come at this from a different different angles. Sometimes people will uh, take the slider settings at the 3 max, the 148, and then take the slider settings at the 20 max, the 258, and either, you know, if there's a big enough gap, pick a middle ground. Or um, if I had to choose, I would probably always lean on the higher side, the 20 max. So I would either, you know, lean on the high side or pick something in the middle that you are comfortable with. But good question there. All right. Uncrabby Cabby said, how are you going to win if you're planning not to lose? Uh, that That is a great question, right? I, I think that, you know, some people are more afraid of losing than they are uh, wanting to win. And, you know, you got you to gotta be willing to risk it to get the biscuit, right? So uh, got to be able to, got to be willing to fall fat, flat on your face and get back up and just keep chugging along. So DFS, you know, we did our contest uh, back test, uh, back testing to come up with our contest selection framework. What Eric found is that a expected to win player is going to win, you know, about six to eight days out of a month if they're playing, you know, every single day, 30 to 31 days. So that's a lot of losing, right? So you got to be um, willing to take some stands, willing to take some shots, get some leverage in spots that you are really comfortable with. Um, one thing for, for myself, you know, I, I listened to, um, all the DFS podcasts really. And there was a podcast with, uh, JJ Zacharias, late round QB on Twitter on the emotional bankroll podcast. And, and he, he said something that really resonated with me where he said, uh, you know, sometimes you're going to find a smash spot and, and you're not going to find them all the time and they don't come around that often. But when you do, you know, you got to be willing to, to really capitalize on that spot. If you really have strong conviction that that is a good spot, right? So, so on a, on a night to night basis, you know, we recommend playing 2.5 to 5% of your bankroll. Uh, maybe there's, maybe you're playing 2.5% and then you're doing some research. You see something that you really feel strongly about and you think it is a really strong edge. Uh, maybe you go back to the contest lobby and, and increase that to 3%, 3.5% of your bankroll for, for that one specific night, for that one specific instance, and, and really try and capitalize on that spot. Um, that, that's something that I try to do from time to time. I haven't found a spot like that in, in over a month. I did the, the one night I did find it. I did listen to his advice and, and I had a really good night that night. Um, but you're not going to find that night every night. You're not going to find it that often, but when it comes, you know, you got to be ready for it and you got to be willing to, you know, take advantage and, and take a chance and, and hopefully have a bigger outcome in that instance. All right. Adrian said, Tried Saberson for a month and didn't see the value at all. It seems like you guys have a lot of great content, but none of it truly helps with winning consistently, in my opinion. Not a criticism, but I just don't learn anything from these videos that helps me cash. I've won more hand building. Uh, Adrian, you know, there's a lot of different ways to play DFS. There's a lot of different ways to win DFS, right? Some people come on the show and, you know, can't get to the lineups they want. Maybe they're better served with a traditional optimizer. Maybe some people can juggle these things better in their head and, and build really good hand building lineups like yourself. Uh, SaberSim is a tool for, you know, users who, who cannot, you know, juggle all these aspects of correlation, ownership fade, uh, range of outcomes in their head. I know I certainly can't. And I know that using the tool saves me a lot of time 
uh, diving through that process. You know, it is a very sophisticated tool. Um, unfortunately, you didn't have, you know, results. It, it was only a month long sample. You know, we really stress our DFS profit plan, building for a, building a long-term strategy that can win you money over time, uh, exercising bankroll management, preparing for variance and swings and being able to weather those until you get to those high upside outcomes. Uh, it's okay to, you know, thank you for trying us out and uh, we wish you the best of luck and hope you uh, come back and find us in the future maybe. All right. Uh, Uncrabby Cabby said, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Uncrabby Cabby. feel like I haven't seen you on the stream in a little bit. So Happy New Year to you as well. All right. Franklin said, How do you figure out what's the best range to use when you're using the GeoMean for each sport? Okay. Good question here. So when looking at this one, uh, what I would say is, you know, it really depends what you are using GeoMean for, right? Are you somebody that values product ownership as a uh, lineup metric, right? Are you somebody who cares about, you know, what the product ownership of my lineups are? For me personally, I don't, but I know some players do, right? They care more looking at, you know, some ownership, product ownership. So it depends what you're really looking for. Uh, I don't know if there's any um, back testing or articles out there that kind of talk about product ownership, but maybe, you know, do a dive into the, into the web and see if you can find something on that. If you are looking for uh, duplication factors with GeoMean, right? What I would do is I would I would follow the the outline for uh, for the GeoMean duplication calculation, which is basically the number of dupes as the numerator divided by the number of entries in the contest. So if it's a hundred thousand entries, you know it's if you would put you know one over a hundred thousand if if you didn't want to be duplicated to the power of one divided by the number of, of, uh, lineups, lineup positions. So, so in this case, you know, say you're playing a hundred thousand entry tournament, I would do one divided by a hundred thousand to the power of one over nine, because there are nine spots in this, that would, that would give you a geo mean value where basically you are, you are assuming that every lineup you play is not going to be duplicated, uh, more than one time or, or will never be duplicated because it'll only be used uh, once by, by yourself. So that would give you a geo mean value that, that you could use for duplication. Maybe you're playing showdown and you're okay with having a lineup that is duped 20 times. Then you would do 20 over a hundred thousand to the power of one over six, where there are only six spots in a showdown lineup. So, so that is how I would use it for duplication um, for, for, for product ownership and, and, and uh, what's the word analyzing, lineups for classic slates, you know, I, I'm probably the wrong resource to give you a, a number or a setting to, to find in that instance. All right. Um, Adrian said, I wish you guys would go into, go more into depth about how you win and what makes a great lineup instead of just saying how to use Sabership. Uh, Adrian, you know, we released a great video yesterday, um, really talking about the research process and how, how, uh, myself specifically comes to, conclusions about where I want to take stands on players and how to do that. You know, I think, I think one thing we said in the video that, that I want to stress here is that I'm only looking for, you know, three to five spots, three to five players to really adjust on a night to night basis. And I am allowing Saberson to do the rest of the work. The, the, the analogy I use is that, you know, I'm letting Saberson handle the, the middle of the stake and I'm, cu and I'm cutting the fat off of the edges and around that. And I really mean it when I say that, uh, this is a great video. You know, if you've been struggling with MBA, uh, still still want to continue to learn and grow, I would check out this video that we just released yesterday. was was a deep dive into my own research process. So, you know, if you're looking for content about, you know, how how Sabersim, you, uh, how we on the Sabersim side win, you know, this is a great video about how I do it. There's similar content over on our YouTube channel about how uh, Max Steinberg did it. You know, Max came on after winning a million dollars in NFL Showdown and walk through his exact build and exactly how he did it. So, so if you're looking for that video, you know, you can come over to our um, YouTube channel. I believe it's how to beat NFL DFS in 2022. Click on this playlist over here and you should find that video. So let me see if I can find it for you guys. Um, if I can't, I would, I would just say uh, Millie here. And then Max Simon joins to discuss his Millie Maker victory. Walk through his entire uh, showdown 
process and talked about how he won a million dollars. So there's plenty of content on here about how we win. It is not a secret. We, we, we use the tool. We trust the tool. We add value in different ways. So I would check out this video, uh, and if, for NFL, I would check out the video that Jordan and I did yesterday along the lines of NBA. All right. That is our last question in the YouTube chat here. Going to jump back to our last question in the Discord here from Naj, and we'll see what we do after that. Oops. Sorry about that. Wrong button. Uh, Naj said, how do you feel about doing 20 different single entries versus doing a 20 max for NBA? Um to be honest, I, I I think both are fine options. I would mostly be looking at the 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 fee to enter those contests, uh, what the payout structure is. You know, how much am I going to get for winning those contests? I think both are fine strategies. Um, I I would assume that you know we're probably talking about like the hundred mans in this instance. Um, I, my my opinion is I'd rather play like the the quarter jukebox rather than play you know. Uh, $21 single entries. I'd rather play the $1 20 max because I think that the payouts are a little bigger. The contest a little bigger, more unique entrance. And um, I, that that's my own opinion though. You could definitely experiment with, with some of those smaller single entries. If, if that is a route that you want to take. All right. That is our last question. We are all caught up in the discord and in the YouTube chat. A uh, really good show today. Uh, you know, nice hour long show. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll be right back tomorrow for our Friday, the 13th show, 2 p.m. Eastern, right here on the Sabersome channel. Don't miss it. Until then, good luck in your contest, and I will see you all later. Take care.